Now, as you take your seat, let's look at Good morning. We're glad that you're able to join us. It's wonderful to be able to gather together and have such nice weather and to be able to appreciate the, uh, the warmth and it feels like springtime, doesn't it? Uh, as we gather together this morning, worship uh, is really not for the Lord. We do come to worship Him, but actually He, put, he instituted that for us because when we worship, it ushers in His presence. And so as we take time this morning to worship God, and it doesn't matter whether we're singing, humming, raising our hands, clapping our hands, it all is worship before Him. And so we want to glorify Him. So we're glad that you were able to join us. Stand as we begin and, uh, in worship time together. Yeah. 
Now, as you take your seat, let's look at this week's announcements. We encourage you to join us for our prayer Zoom group on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. You can sign up on the website and then an email will be sent to your inbox with the Zoom link in it. We hope that you can join us. This week is the last week to register to receive a family kit for the Easter extravaganza. If you're able to help us put the kits together or to deliver the kits, then please contact Pastor Sarah Beth. Also, if you're willing to donate towards these kits, each kit costs approximately $10 per family, and so your generosity is appreciated. We want to say thank you to those that have already given, and if you have not yet given, please make sure to mark your donation as Easter kits or Easter extravaganza, and that money will be directed towards this project. Easter is just right around the corner, and so we wanted to make sure that you knew that we were planning to have an in-person Good Friday experience at 10 a.m. here at Bethel. Also, you can join us on Sunday at 10 a.m. for Easter Sunday. Easter is a great time to invite family or neighbors to church, so even during this COVID time, make sure you take time to reach out to someone and invite them to come to church with you. It was so great to have some of you join us for our midweek coffee break last Wednesday. I want to encourage you, we're going to do this again this Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. in the foyer. Everyone is welcome, so please join us for a coffee or a tea or water and enjoy some fellowship together. Hi folks, me again. Just an update on our pulpit search. Um, Friday night we completed our last interview and another great interview. We've got three super candidates. Now we have to wait for God to tell us which one he wants us to have. Um, I just invite you over the next few days to take some time to fast and pray and uh, just pray for God's guidance as uh, we seek his man for this job. I uh, just thank you and covet your prayers as we move forward and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandy Burgrave, and I'm so glad that some of us are able to make it to church to hear the word of God, and, but we're following all the criteria to keep safe here. And I thank the Lord that we're living in a time when even though we have COVID-19, we have internet, TV, and radio, which we can listen to and still hear the word of God. Even at home, most of us have Bibles that we can read. And I pray you share this good news with others in your family or other people you know to win more souls for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now today I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22b to 27 from my Bible called the Learning Bible. Okay? I do everything I can to win everyone I can possibly can. I do all this for the good news because I want to share in its blessings. You know that many runners run a race and only one of them wins the prize. So run to win. Athletes work hard to win a crown that doesn't last. But we do it for a crown that lasts forever. I don't run without a goal. And I don't box by beating my fists up in the air. I keep my body under control and make it my slave. I won't lose out after telling the good news to others. My hope and prayer is that God will bless and keep you always in his tender, loving care. Thank you. Through the shadow, your love surrounds. 
as me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. to the 
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name You may be seated then. It is wonderful that uh, we are able to rejoice and praise the Lord together. It's wonderful to be able to take time and, and uh, acknowledge His presence with us. Uh, it's difficult when you're not able to really just sing out, isn't it? <laughs> Man, I, I have a hard time holding back, but uh, the truth is, is that as we worship, God comes and His presence is with us, and so I'm thankful for that. Thankful for those of you that are able to join by uh, online, and we just trust that God's presence would be with you in your home as well. It's not just here. God can be everywhere at any time, all the time. And so I'm thankful for that, because there's a lot of times when sometimes I, I get ahead of Him, and uh, I realize, just need to realize that I'm not really ahead of Him. I may think in my mind I am, but He's just waiting for me. And so uh, I, we're, it's, it's great to be able to be in His presence. Over the last little while, I've been sharing about the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, today I wanted to share with you a little bit about the final one. And the final one in the list that, uh, of the nine is self-control. Uh, even though it's listed last, it is probably the one that should have come first as far in terms of what the priority is because it requires self-control to be able to do the other ones. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. That self-control is what uh, each of us need to be able to uh, harness into our lives in order for us to fulfill the destiny that God has for us. And so I've, been, I've entitled this message, Discipline Determines destiny. And uh, you can see this little boy, he has uh, some discipline, but not a lot, right? So <laughs> he's just a typical little boy. But self-control is almost impossible to achieve without discipline in our lives. 
And that term discipline, it, it is both a noun, but it is also a verb. And so we think of discipline, it describes a practice of training to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment or consequences to correct that uh, misbehavior or disobedience. And the, the truth is that it's, uh, it calls it punishment, but it's really consequences for the actions that we take. So sometimes they can be painful consequences, sometimes they can be encouraging consequences, but both will have the same effect. And sometimes it's easier in our society that we apply the, the consequence that creates a little bit of discomfort in order to be able to uh, shape both children and for us as well. Uh, I know that my mom and dad, they had to apply a few of the consequences in my life to be able to help shape me to be the, the man that I am. And uh, so I, I need to be thankful for that. But the verb then is to train and to obey the rules. And so that when we talk about discipline, often we think more about the, uh, you know, the punishment aspect of that discipline or the uh, consequence that uh, is, is uh, perhaps hurtful to us. But as we were looking at the, this portion of Scripture that was read for, by uh, Sandy this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it was talking about the fact that uh, we need to have a, a sense of self-discipline, and it talks about athletes and the training that they, they undergo. And, and it talks about uh, uh, the boxer beating the air. There's a certain amount of training that is necessary, self-discipline, in order to be able to accomplish those things. You see, every endeavor in our society requires some level of self-control or discipline. And it, not just the athletes to be successful. You, you know, a doctor, teacher, policeman, fireman, auto mechanic, bus or truck driver, any of them. They need some level of self-control. Because you don't want a doctor coming in and uh, going to be doing an operation on you and say, well, I washed my hands yesterday, so I really don't think I need to do that today. No, he has the self-discipline to know that he washes his hands before he does any operation or he involves so that he is able to control that. Or a policeman, whether he decides that he's going to have his gun with him or not going to have his gun with him, there's a self-discipline or the time when he is to use it. And we've had some situations in our society, both here in Canada and down in the United States, where sometimes we're wondering if the self-discipline is still evident there. But it takes self-discipline on both parts. It needs the one, the perpetrator of doing uh, things that are perhaps contrary to what the law says and the, and the, and the uh, policeman who is instigated. There needs to be some self-discipline that is taking place. There needs to be some control. The society is lacking significantly, I believe, in self-control and in discipline. And you can see it with perhaps our young people and that there's difficulty in terms of being able to respond in the way they should. And, and uh, you can see some of the things that are reported on the news, whether it be use of guns that are taking place often within our, our cities, but it can happen anywhere. It can happen here in Tilsonburg as well. And it requires self-control and discipline. But for us as believers, you see, as followers of Jesus Christ, it's only right that you and I want to pr His purpose for our lives. But without discipline, the distractions of life, then they will interfere with our God-given destiny. In other words, if we don't have those disciplines put into our life. I remember uh, um, when my boys were younger. And so as a father, there were certain things I needed to do to be able to create consequences for things that they would do because they're little boys. And, they, they would, but, and I can remember times when we'd be in the mall and you'd have some child that was just out of control in terms of being able to have self-control. They were screaming, they were yelling, they were kicking their parents and everything else. And I can remember my boy sort of looking at me, up at me like this saying, well, somebody needs to do something about this, you know? Like you just can't let that continue on because they, they knew what would happen if they had done that. I think they were expecting me to go over there and do anything. Well, uh, you know, it's way beyond my, uh, my, my purview to be able to do something like that. But at the same time, it's when we look into our lives and we realize that like an athlete in training, we must exercise self-control and restraint, living with that specific goal in mind. And that's what 1 Corinthians 9 is saying, is that we need to keep our focus, and to be able to do that, we need to try and get rid of all the other distractions and what God has really purposed for us to do. 
And really, his purpose is for us to be able to love God and to love our neighbors. That's really what his purpose is for us, because ultimately, he wants that none would perish. And so when we exercise self-control, when we keep our focus on what is, because sometimes there are so many other distractions that can get us off track from where God wants us to be. But the truth is, is that God has a plan and a purpose. Simply wanting to fulfill God's will for our lives is not enough. It is discipline, not just desire, because it determines then our destiny. The discipline of our lives is necessary for it to take place. And so to look at this from 1 Corinthians, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. First of all, there there are two really levels that we have in discipline. There is the self uh, discipline that the scripture talks about. It talks about self-control. Well, uh, really that self, it's, and so that's that personal training that develops self-control and character in us, resulting in an orderly and efficient life. And sometimes you, we will see in, in, within our society that there are those that have not had that. Either they haven't had the parent, parental involvement, or perhaps their parents have been fairly lax in terms of, of helping to shape their lives, and so that they become almost uncontrollable in the way that they respond to certain things. And so God wants us to live in, a, in, a, in developing our character so that we live an orderly and efficient life. You and I must practice self-discipline in the power of the Spirit. And so that's why I believe that it's included here as one of the fruits of the Spirit, because sometimes we just can't do it on our own. Because when we do things on our own, we want to go whatever is the easiest path, the path of least resistance. Whenever there aren't those other things around us to be able to help us, then we will do whatever we feel is right. And actually in our society, that is what it's telling you is acceptable, that you do whatever makes you feel good. But the truth is, there there is a set pattern that God has for us because he knows that everything that we decide to do is not going to be in our best interest. And he wants us to live a blessed, orderly, and efficient life so that what we can accomplish his purpose. And sometimes we'll get ourselves off track and we do not accomplish then the purpose that God has for us. Because there's another discipline that comes, and that is a divine discipline. And that is the consequences in God's correction when we step out of his will or disobey him. From Hebrews 12 and 5, it says, And you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of your Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And so for me as a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to understand that I'm going to receive the Lord's correction when I get out of line. And he's going to speak to me in different ways. Sometimes, thankfully, he does so through his word. Thankfully, it's when I pray. And thankfully, it's through you as well who will speak into my life or when you speak into others that are uh, fellow followers or it could perhaps be parents or your spouse that are able to help us because God directs them to shape us by that divine discipline that is necessary. Because why? Because the Lord disciplines us because we are his sons and his daughters. We are his followers. We are his kids. And just the same as you as a parent would say to your son, do not cross that line and step out on that road without looking both ways. How many have that discipline in their life? (laughs) Well, if you don't, how come you're still alive? Because to tell you the truth, every time you cross the road, you need to look both ways, right? It's not because they want you to see the cars that are coming, although that is important. It's so that your life would be sustained and that you would not be injured. That's why he wants us to look both. That's why the the, the, uh, discipline is to look both ways. It's not to be able to be controlling of us. It is to be able to impart to us something that we, we think is so simple, but the truth is, is that you, when you do it over and over again, and there's certain things that you probably have in, in your life that you do now, even because you brush your teeth, right? And why do you do that? It's a discipline to be able to make sure that your teeth stay healthy and strong. You eat the right food. 
You uh, get lots of sleep, hopefully, or rest, I should say, and so that you're able to function the way God has intended for you to function. Those take disciplines in order for it to happen. But why is self-discipline necessary? Well, first of all, self-discipline is, ne- is essential to godliness. You see, God wants us to be like him. We cannot be like him completely, but we need to act in godliness. It is to be God-like. In 1 Peter 1 and 15, it says, But just as, you, as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Now, we cannot be holy all by ourselves. Our, uh, this fleshly side of us will not allow that to happen because we will make decisions just like Paul talked about. I do the things that I don't want to do, but I for, and, and I, I do some of the things that I, I know are right, and, and so that there's a confusion that sometimes is within our lives. But God wants us to live holy lives through Him. It's Him living through us. And in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, it says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value, or godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So what exactly is godliness? You see, it's not just the quality of being devoutly religious or pious, which is the way that the uh, dictionary describes godliness. It is not that. It is being able to live in the understanding and knowing what God has asked us to do of what he's described in his word and to do it to the best of our ability. You see, when we put him first, when we put the word of God into our heart so that we are not so we're uh, not able to sin against him. There was a fellow by the name of Jerry Bridges, and he wrote a, a book called Respectable Sins. And then he talked about dishonesty. And we as a people, we would say, well, we're not dishonest. We do things that are right. But when we look at some things that uh, sometimes it's easy, so for, so for your, it's almost time to do our, our tax returns, do we report all the money that we've received before the government? Because if we don't, we're dishonest. And in our country, and in our society, I was reading in the paper, there are billions of dollars that go out that are done through the internet, through all the social media, through uh, um, all, all the different uh, ways that you're able to uh, sell stuff these days, Kijiji and all those kinds of things. And that whenever you receive income, the government says that we have to report that to them. And I, and, and I had to do some self-assessment. Because sometimes when I've been involved and I've gone to churches and I receive an honorarium, and they don't give you a receipt or anything for it, so it's just cash, it comes in the form of a check. I don't need to report that, do I? Well, the truth is I do. And I have been. Because the Lord, several years ago when I started doing this, convicted me and said, Ken, you are not telling the government everything. And so I, I, I've reported. And I went back and I corrected the things, the places where I had I'd made mistakes, where I had not reported. And I reported in the following year. Because the truth is, I don't want anything to hold me back from being t- completely sold out to God and to live in the way that he intended me in godliness. You see, when I'm disobedient to what he asks me to do, when I'm anxious about things, when I'm frustrated about things and don't surrender it to God, when I worry about things and not surrender it to God, when I'm fearful, when there is pride in my life, I ask God, Lord, you need to help me. Because my fleshly side of me keeps me from being everything that you want me to be, which is godly, and to live the way God has intended for me to live. And when I do that, I'm just trusting that God will give me favor, that he'll give me insight into how I need to live, so that I am able to bless others and be a blessing then to him. So when I get to heaven, it's not just well done, 
that every day I make them smile at the way I've lived my life. You see, that's why in the military they do, my, they do uh, things over and over again to discipline them, those soldiers who are going uh, potentially into a battle. That's why they have to make their beds. That's why they have to store their things properly. That's why everything that they do is done in an orderly and military kind of way. And we say, well, we wouldn't want to live that way. But the truth is, in doing that, it disciplines them so that they are able to think in an orderly and disciplined way. And so when the commander says, you do this, yes, sir, they do it right away. That is the whole purpose of the discipline that you see in a military-type training. And, and so, and so when, when you look at uh, the things that you've done, and for me as a grandfather now, and I've got two boys, and they've got wonderful, uh, I've got great-grandchildren uh, and great-great-grandchildren. I'm thankful for them. But it's interesting, when I see my sons and the way that they care for their kids and the way that they speak to them, they've learned how to do that from me. And it makes me nervous because you hear them, right? When they say that, when they talk to their kids, they use some of the, even the same language that I used with them. And some of it I didn't think was the best language I could have used, perhaps. And I, I, I say, Lord, forgive me. But the, the truth is, is that it's that discipline that they saw and applied to them, they now apply to their children. And it'll be the same. It'll keep going on and on. But the truth is, is that I just want to make sure that the way that I care for my family, and, and now I've gone beyond the, the time when I, can, I can't discipline them anymore. They're, they're, it's, they're on their own. But the truth is, is that God will, perha- will help them to be able to discipline and to be able to care for their kids and create the consequences that they need to in order to be able to shape their lives. Because the kids today... Their discipline is coming through Fortnite. Their discipline is coming through other video games that they get online. Their discipline is coming through the internet. And the truth is, is that there's only one way that discipline really comes. And that is through divine discipline and through self-discipline. And for us as parents, we want to make sure that we shape our kids so that they are to function in the way that would honor God and be submitted unto him. You see, because until we are able to have uh, the discipline that is meted out as we've grown, sometimes we could become confused about the divine discipline that God brings into our life and we misunderstand it. We think we serve then an angry God. We think that we serve a God that uh, he doesn't care about the earthquakes and and, uh, the tidal waves and the things that have been going on that you read in, uh, in, in the news these days, the volcano eruptions that have taken place in Iceland or the earthquakes in Japan that have created some of the tsunamis. And, and uh, we're just saying, Lord, help us, Lord, to realize that, that our desire for you is far greater than anything else that could go on, that our desire to follow you. See, unless we submit our natural desires to the control of the Spirit, they will, desi- they will dominate our lives. We'll eat too much food. We won't get enough rest. We'll choose the wrong friends. But they must be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Remember I did the model of the body, soul, and spirit. The soul, when it's out of rest, looks is, is comforted either by the body or by the spirit. When we turn to the body, when we turn to the flesh, to comfort the soul, mind, will, and emotions, then we are not going to be able to be disciplined in the way that God has for us to live. We will be outside of that discipline. And we need to invite the Holy Spirit, because as soon as we bring the spirit in, then the fleshly side of us becomes diminished. So what can we expect when we fail to practice self-control? When an undisciplined life causes us to indulge in our fleshly and carnal desires, usually we'll find ourselves stepping out of God's will if we fail to practice self-discipline. 
And I remember this happened for me many times as a young person growing up, that uh, I made decisions that took me away from the discipline that God wanted for me. But I'm thankful that he either had friends for me, or he had uh, others that were around me, or the Spirit himself that spoke to my heart that brought me back closer to him so that I could get to a place now where I am totally committed to what God has for me. But we go through those ups and downs, and when we indulge those carnal desires, and it doesn't matter whether it is, whatever it is, we need to be uh, submitted to God. We become defensive about our sinful lifestyles. They can be ungodly or worldly. We can say, no, it's okay, we can do this, it's all right, we can get away with it. But the truth is, is that we can't. See, when I was growing up with a kid who was the Pentecostal church that I was part of, because I'm third generation Pentecostal, it was all about do's and don'ts. We didn't play cards. We didn't drink alcohol. We didn't smoke or do drugs. We thought those were all the things that would make us holy. And really, I ended up with a whole list of do's and don'ts. The trouble is, when you do up a list like that, then you fall into a judgmental mentality about everything. And I'm not saying that all of those things that we stayed away from were not good actions, disciplined actions to do. But what I'm saying is that because I didn't do them, I felt that I was in the right place. The truth is, as soon as I begin to think that, then I've stepped into the same realm because I've stepped into a a worldly realm. God wants me to go beyond that. And so the reason that I I don't smoke now is because I know that it's not good for my body. The reason that I, I don't consume alcohol now is because I know it'll influence my judgments. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason that I, I don't do some of these other things, and some of them I didn't fully understand. I couldn't go to movies. I couldn't, uh, uh, there were certain things that we weren't able to do. Couldn't bowl. Couldn't play pool. It was all do's and don'ts. But God didn't intend for me. Sure, it was a discipline in my life, but the truth is is that I allowed it to become the carnality side of me because of the judgmentalism in it. God wants us to walk in a way that is godly before him. We always need to be focused on what the word of God says, not what goes on around us. And some of these things are probably good disciplines not to be involved in. But the truth is, is that we just have to be careful because there will be those that perhaps they are still battling with that and we just need to encourage them and help them. Some of these things, these practices will cause us to have poor health. When we don't get enough sleep, when we don't eat properly. Sometimes it'll harm our finances and we can get into debt. And if you look at statistically our our country, they they talk about the, uh, each person's level of debt is incredible, whether it be credit card debt or whether it be uh, bank debt or other things or overdrafts. And if we don't discipline ourselves, we can end up spending. And the whole purpose or the way that our society works is that they want us to spend. If we stop spending, then our, our whole system of economy begins to fall apart. But the truth is we have to be disciplined in how we do that. We could perhaps perform poorly on the job. In extreme forms, a lack of discipline can result even in a job loss. We can be late for work, cut corners, or we can procrastinate, put things off. And I had to learn to discipline myself that I would Whatever the Lord would put in front of me, I felt that that is what God wanted me to do. If I'm walking down the street and I see garbage on the street, then I want to pick it up and find the nearest garbage can to throw it out. Because if you walk around through the parks in London anyway, you'll see garbage and stuff everywhere. Because people are undisciplined in the way that they live their life. And so it can result in things that uh, will even help that we would perform poorly in the job that we have. 
Because whatever the Lord gives you to do it, you do it with all of your heart and with all of your might. Because it brings honor to him. Could cause us to be overlooked for a promotion. In contrast, discipline often prepares us then for that next opportunity. We can develop slothful or lazy habits. In other words, when you see uh, sometimes right now because of the job situation, it's difficult to be able to get out there and do that. And so it's, it's easy to become lazy at home and to become slothful. We have to continue to discipline ourselves in order to be able beyond that. Sometimes we even speak recklessly. We'll say things that perhaps can be hurtful. Uh, we arrive late. <laughs> when I was looking at this one, because I got some of this, this uh, from a, a message that I heard from Dr. Charles Stanley. And I thought, he is so right about that. Because I, I know that uh, in church, and I'm not being, saying this to be critical, but I've learned that if I'm not 15 minutes early, then I'm late. But part of that's because I'm 70, right? And, and I, I don't have little kids to get ready for church. I don't have other things that I need to do. But the truth is, is that if I discipline myself to arrive on time, I know that in the military, if you're not there for muster, then there's a penalty for you, a consequence. You may be doing uh, KP. You may be cleaning the washrooms. You may be... There's, because... There, there's an importance in being able to say that if I'm going to be there at a certain time that we're there. Sometimes we'll end up wasting time and energy. We live by a schedule, setting our priorities for each date and then following them through. But it needs to be balanced. We can't be so overly organized that we don't have room for when the Holy Spirit sometimes moves in our lives. But I know for Jane and I, we make notes. <laughs> I've, got, I've got post-it notes everywhere in my house, right? Especially on the mirrors, because that's where it is. So it keeps, me, keeps us on track so we know. It can even result in us having a poor testimony. An undisciplined life compromises a believer's witness, as you saw in verse 27. So what is required for a disciplined life? First of all, a definite purpose. Goals clarified, but disciplines are needed for achievement. What is your life purpose? Youth feel hopeless within our society, and if you ask them, what is your goal? What is it that you want to accomplish? What is the things that, that motivate you to do what you do? Like, what motivates you to spend Six hours, seven hours, eight hours a day playing Fortnite. What is the motivation to that? Or any other kind of, of thing that we can become so fixated on that we end up not doing and following the, the definite purpose that God has for it. What are the goals and what motivates you? I've been asking my grandchildren that. Jane and I have been asking them, what motivates you? Because until you understand the motivation, it's difficult to know what the consequence can be to be able to help shape them to be able to do what I believe is the purpose God has for them. And so for myself as well. In other words, and, and the second thing is that we need to detach from things that draw us away from our goals. So if there are things that distract us, then we need to move away from those. The third is to pursue our objectives then with diligence. Reflecting on the worthiness of your goal will keep you on course to know what exactly it is that God has. And that we need to then be consistent. The full benefits of the self-control life can be found only through regular practice. So we practice certain things. We do them automatically. But the truth, truth is, is there's a spiritual side of us that we need to do that with as well. We need to practice self-control, because even if you fail sometimes, we need to continue to work on that self-discipline, because we will fail. I do all the time. This message, man, this was hard to prepare, to tell you the truth, because there was a lot of self-evaluation looking at it. I can't talk to you about this without having to talk to myself, because we all need to live within the self-control that God is intended for. And we need to learn to say no in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the indwelling presence of the Spirit is available to empower us. 
And so these are some of the rewards of discipline, a more orderly and less stressful life. And I've seen a lot of people that have a lot of stress within their life. Well, God wants to uh, bring, uh, dis- or bring less stress, and a disciplined life will do that, especially if you're able to do it yourself. Because it'll increase your peace, your joy, your love, and your confidence. That's why I said this one needed to go at the beginning in terms of the fruits of the Spirit. It'll improve your self-esteem. Setting achieving goals will give you a sense then of accomplishment that I've been able to achieve these things. It'll increase your productivity. A well-planned day is generally more fruitful. We have the ability to respond correctly to stressful and urgent situations then because we have other things that have been packed out for us. It'll mean better health. We'll eat right. We'll exercise, we'll avoid drugs and alcohol abuse, and, and we'll get the proper rest. And many illnesses would be avoided by that as well, I believe. It would have a positive impact on others. You see, when we live disciplined lives, we often inspire others to do the same. Sometimes it can be conviction that the person, because I've been in places where I say, well, no, I... I I'd love to have a drink of orange juice or ginger ale or Coca-Cola, but I'm, I'm not interested in a beer. And then, I'll, then the person spends the next five minutes explaining why they don't really need to have a beer, but they, you know, they like it. Because it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When I was playing baseball, they knew I didn't drink beer. And after the game, when we, uh, it was slow pitch, and so after the game, when they'd all get together and they'd break out the bottles of beer, and they'd always bring a Coke for me, I would have at least one or two of them that would come to me after the game and explain why they don't need beer. Why? It's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. See, they they wanted to be able to have the discipline in their life as well, because for some of them, they drank more beer than they needed to. And they they weren't disciplined in the way that they, they lived their lives. You see, to this day, the foundation my mother laid in my life helps motivate me to work with excellence at whatever I do. In turn, I taught my sons to be disciplined, which has helped them to succeed as adults as well. And my one youngest son, he's in the military. He decided to join up as a reservist in the, in the Navy because he loves that disciplined life. And then finally, is that there is an eternal reward. The most significant benefit of discipline will come from Jesus in the day that we stand before him, and he'll say, well done. So how do you begin? How do you get to a place, a life of discipline? First of all, spending time each day reading God's word, not for brownie points, but for the direction and encouragement that only the Word of God can give us. We need to make time for prayer. Wake up earlier or limit other activities in order to give God priority in your life. We just need to take time to be able to pray, to acknowledge Him. And it says, actually, we need to do that without ceasing. And so it could be something that uh, you can talk to God all the time because really that's what prayer is all about. It's just a communication with the Lord. Thirdly, we need to tithe our income. A discipline that I put in my life when I was young, and I've shared that with you when I got my first paper route. My mom said, actually, I I was doing that before because she would always give me an offering to be able to put in when I went to church. And I learned that discipline. I've never known anything different. It wasn't until I I became involved in in, uh, church leadership that I realized that not everybody actually tithed. And when you heard about the different issues people were facing financially, I realized that I wasn't facing that because the Lord was helped me to be able to be not just to tithe. In the New Testament, it says that we need to be generous. And I believe that the tithe is where is the beginning point. And then when we need to attend worship, when we come together on Sundays, there is something that is important about that. Meeting with fellow believers to fellowship and study His Word deepens our relationship with Him. And many people just want to date the church, but God wants us to be committed to one another. The church is not the building. The church is the people. One of the things when uh, I was at uh, our district office, we did a coaching uh, training, teaching us how to coach. And 
One of the things that they showed us was called a GROW model, G-R-O-W. The G was to be able to establish a goal. What is it that you want to be able to do? The R were the realities then about achieving the goal. I want to uh, climb Mount Kilimanjaro. That's my goal. What are the realities of achieving the goal? Well, I need, uh, you know, $50,000 to get me there and hire a Sherpa and all the rest of the equipment. And All right, so you go through the realities of that. What are the options? Well, I could, I could climb Boulder Hill in London, you know. I mean, that, that could be a, one of the options. Or, or there could be a, a lesser mountain that doesn't cost me as much money. And then the W is, will I do it? Well... Thinking about it, I, I don't think I will. I don't think I'll be climbing that. And so I need to change my goal again and begin to think differently. But if my goal was to be able to climb Bowler Mountain, I could make that happen. For those of you that have been to London, you know how big Bowler Mountain is. It's no Mount Kilimanjaro. You see, the Lord designed you for a special purpose, one that will satisfy you like no other. Don't allow your natural desires to hinder your ability to reach his purpose for you. The sacrifices of a well-disciplined life are nothing in comparison to the rewards of fulfilling your God-given destiny. It's a prize well worth the training. An old hymn that we used to sing, written by Francis Havergal. Listen to these words. It was, take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour, at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. That is a disciplined life. If you sing that, then you are making a proclamation of a disciplined life before the Lord, consecrated to Him. You see, as we've looked at fruit of the Spirit, self-discipline and the other fruits are not at you, they are in you. They are qualities, not a quantity. They can be brought to bear in your life, not bought in life. You can never be a self-disciplinarian, be a disciple of self-discipline, and it will be a quality in you. Because when we look at the fruits of the Spirit, we realize that they are special to us. I was reading this story, and it came out of the Middle East of about three merchants that were crossing the desert, and they were traveling at night in the darkness to avoid the heat of the day. And as they were crossing over a dry creek bed, a loud, attention-demanding voice out of the darkness commanded them to stop. They were ordered to get down off their camels, stoop down, and pick up pebbles from the creek bed and put them into their pockets. Immediately after doing as they had been commanded, they were then told to leave that place and continue until dawn before they stopped to set up camp. This mysterious voice told them that in the morning they would be both sad and happy. Understandably shaken, they obeyed the voice and traveled on through the rest of the night without stopping. When the morning dawned, these three merchants anxiously looked into their pockets, and instead of finding the pebbles as expected, there were precious jewels. And they were both happy and sad. Happy that they had picked up some of the pebbles, but sad because they hadn't gathered more when they had the opportunity. And I just want to tell you that the fruit of the Spirit are like these pebbles. Take a look at them. They are precious jewels to you. Pick them up. Use them for the glory of God in your life. You can only do it by the power of the Spirit. 
but may it be so for you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Take our lives, Lord, and let them be. Only always for you. So, Father, thank you that, Father, as we have disciplined our lives, and for many of us, we've grown up in a disciplined home. But many that we see today within our society, and and you talk to school teachers, you talk to policemen, we talk to to many that would say it it is out of control because there is no self-discipline. Parents are unsure even how to discipline their children because it has become so rampant. But Father, we just pray by the power of the Holy Spirit for us right here that you would help us to be able to put into our lives and to use the self-control that, Lord, is part of what we received with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you hear us when we pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are close. That, Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would help each one both here and at home, Lord, to be able to live completely the way that you had intended them. That, Father, that you would bring glory to yourself and blessing to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me as we sing this last song together.
Thank you for joining us today. We are so glad that you are here in house and we're glad that you've joined us online. Before we leave though, we want to encourage you to take some time and discuss these three questions that'll be on the screen in a moment. And um, we just, that's okay. <laughs> We just want to encourage you to discuss these questions with people around you, whether you're here in the house or whether you're at home. Uh, maybe call a friend and talk to them about it. It's really important for us to take some time to figure out how we can walk out the message that we've heard this morning, not just come and hear it and then leave and have lunch and go on about our day, but we want to live the word that God has given us this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a great week.